Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick Gaming Tetacon video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start things out with some benchmarks that we've actually conducted with the RTX 2080 Ti versus the GTX 1080 Ti. Now, these are a little different. These are not standard rasterization performance numbers. Instead, these are ray tracing numbers. If you're unfamiliar, there has been a recent update to Windows along with DirectX 12, and Nvidia have also put out the latest drivers, 4.16 point something. And these allow us to get a first glimpse, at least to the public, of what Nvidia were touting when they were discussing the ray tracing performance of the RTX series of cards. In other words, Turing's real um, PS de resistance, the main reason that you would actually plonk down your cash and buy one of these GPUs. Up until now, we've had to trust NVIDIA's own internal numbers and the odd leaked benchmark here or there. Now, these compiled benchmarks are not gaming. So what we don't have is, for example, how this will impact, let's say, Metro. But it does give us an indication of at least a simple ray tracing scene, or more accurately, two ray tracing scenes. I'm going to put a link in the video description so you can actually download these demos and test them out on your particular card. If you do decide to do that, very curious to know what your performance numbers are. So the primary thing, of course, would be the GPU. The CPU has very little to do with this. In fact, in our testing, uh, actually, a small aside, I was actually at a friend's house yesterday. Uh, he actually has an RTX 2080 Ti. He's got a Founders Edition card, and we're doing some testing. And AIM has also been doing testing with our Gigabyte RTX 2080 Ti, which is what these numbers are from, against uh, the 1080 Ti that we have as well. And it's actually rather interesting because the performance is very little on the CPU side. Everything's on the GPU. And it does also mean that the shader clock speed does have a direct impact on the performance of ray tracing. But we'll get into that in just a moment. Let's have a look at a few performance numbers. It's immediately clear that you're looking at a huge, gargantuan chasm of a difference between the 1080 Ti and the 2080 Ti cards. So yes, at least according to these simple benchmarks, it would appear that Nvidia's claims do have some merit. Of course, how this actually handles games is still a different question. Until we see updates to Shadow of the Tomb Raider and until Metro pops out, it's going to be very difficult to know how these GPUs are going to exactly fare. It's also going to be curious to, hit, to see how lower cards in the RTX spectrum, for example, the RTX 2070, will also be able to run games and what limitations we're going to be seeing there. Also in our testing, we notice very little difference, at least in these simple benchmarks, with memory bandwidth, which is not the case, by the way, with games. Uh, we've been doing some testing, and memory clock speed on Turing does make some difference when it comes to games, but at least in these simple benchmarks, no, it is purely shader uh, orientated. But of course, that doesn't mean much, because will this translate once again to Shadow of the Tomb Raider? Probably yes, because obviously it's also needing to do traditional rasterization as well. Nevertheless, this is fascinating uh, as an insight to what we're going to be seeing from games of the future. And it's possible, at least, that NVIDIA's claims do have some merit. I don't necessarily know if we're going to be seeing 4K 60fps with all titles, with ray tracing. But I suspect as the SDKs and drivers along with Windows becomes better updated and uh, the toolkits become better for developers, of course, along with the familiarity of that, I suspect performance is going to go up, and if uh, this really is the future of games, of course, we're going to see future architectures, for example, the theoretical Turing refresh, which we can presume is going to be on a smaller shrunk process, and so on. We can presume that we're going to see ray tracing go up exponentially. And a small update concerning the second generation of Fred Ripper processors. As you are possibly aware, AMD are refreshing their Fred Ripper line processors, which of course previously had the flagship of the 1950X. Now the flagship is the 2990WX, with the lower end SKUs nowhere to be seen, at least until now. At the end of this month, uh, AMD will be releasing the 12 and 24 core SKUs, along with some major updates to the performance of these processors, particularly in games. How much of an update? Well, According to the performance numbers, which I promise we'll go into in just a moment, AMD are claiming that we could see up to a 50% uptick in the performance of video games, which is pretty darn substantial. So first of all, let's go through the uh, processor SKUs that are yet to be released. So the 24-core 
2970WX will cost 1300 US dollars and the 12 core processor, the 2920X, will cost 649 US dollars. The biggest change here though is dynamic local mode. What this does is change the way the operating system and CPU prioritizes tasks and its residency in memory. Let's go through a few performance numbers and then we can go through exactly how this functions. Certain games like Far Cry, yes, we see a modest increase in performance, 10%, roughly the same for PUBG, but wait a minute, what about Battlefield? That's 47%, that is substantial. We also see a rather nice increase in Unreal Engine uh, compile time as well, 15%, ideally in isolation, almost 20%. Once again, these are not poor performance metrics. It's quite impressive. And of course, it will also include the 2990WX CPUs as well. So how exactly does this work? AMD's Robert Halleck actually has put out a blog post. I'd suggest you read it if you're interested in Threadripper processors. I'll link it, of course, in the description of this video. According to the blog post, I'll read that out first and then I'll give my quick two cents on this. A bit of background is required to answer this question. For AMD Threadripper X series of CPUs, each processor die has directly connected memory. Local mode and distributed mode change how operating systems see these CPUs. In local mode, the OS sees two partitions called NUMA nodes, each with one die's worth of CPU cores and RAM. Local mode sends hints to the CPU that threads and their memory contents should be kept within the same node, if possible, to minimize memory latency. In distributed mode, the OS sees a single large pool, UMA mode, with all available dies and memory groups together. So what exactly does this mean? Well, it really comes down to how Threadripper processors have been created, along with the X399 motherboards. Essentially, Threadripper processors are created with numerous CCX modules, but not all of those modules have direct access to a memory controller. Some of those modules need to access their memory through another module. So what we have here is a way for AMD to prioritize certain tasks and to put those tasks on CPU cores which have direct access to memory. Robert Halleck summarizes this by stating that it operates on the fly without a reboot to toggle between the two modes, ensures that demanding uh, threads are executed on dies with local memory access, and does not fundamentally change how the operating system sees the process of resources. As you can imagine, there are possibly some downsides to this, and we're going to have to start testing them and doing benchmarks to really know. But either way, if you're a gamer, I suspect that this is going to be a very handy mode to operate the processors in. After all, that has been one of the weaknesses of HEDD processors, and certainly Threadripper is no exception. They don't always excel in gaming. So with this fix, hopefully we can see improved gaming performance, and it will make the processors even more palatable, particularly given the price point. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, if you have, like, share, comment, and subscribe. Uh, if you are uh, wanting to, you can check out our Patreon, which is, of course, linked in the video description, along with an Amazon affiliate link. That's not to say you have to use them, but, of course, they do help us out if you so desire. And with all that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.